Detroit, Michigan. It's about to go all the way down. That's right. The spring cookout is coming your way April 24th through the 26th. Get your tickets now to attend the number one independent entertainment summit in the world. There's going to be a comedy show, classes, networking, and of course, the cooking. Come connect and link with some of the dopest people in the business. You don't want to miss this opportunity, so click the link in the bio and get your tickets today. We will see you there. Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, Oga, from Hip Hop News Uncensored, and sitting across from me is my co-host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam Ant, CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. We got a special guest in the building. We got the president and CEO of Sovereign Brand yeah. on the podcast today. Mr. Brett Barish is on our podcast. Mr. Barish, how you doing this afternoon, sir? I'm, I'm fantastic. I'm looking forward to this, and there's nothing better than... Uh, than uh, Talking, just talking, talking business. How's that? Yeah, that's something we like to do. And um, we appreciate people that like to talk good business and hear their story and how they got what they got. You are absolutely somebody that is sensational in the wine and liquor game and definitely interested in hearing on how you got to where you are. So for the people who don't know, for the listeners that are um, getting introduced to Brett Barris, just give them a little introduction of, of who you are. And just a quick synopsis of how we got here. Sure. So you may know my brand. So some past brands uh, are Ace of Spades, Armand de Brignac, uh, Doucet Cognac, uh, uh, Bel Air is today, Bamboo, the number one premium rum in the world. Mm. Uh, uh, my newest brand, which is called The Deacon, is a whiskey launching in 60, 70 countries right now. Vion, which is uh, competes in the cognac and liqueur categories. And I've got a gin called McQueen in the Violet Fog from Junjai, Brazil, that's on fire right now in the U.S. So mm -hmm. some neat brands in the wine and spirit space. Awesome. awesome. So I heard you talking about your father was in the liquor game. Um, is it safe to assume that's what kind of got you started? And just tell us what exactly got you started in the liquor yeah, game. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I like to... The way I think about myself is there's two types of people in this world. One know who knows exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. and the other is someone like me, where I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something on my own. And um, I made them. I didn't know what it was. So I had nothing to pick and choose. And it wasn't until my late uh, till my late 30s that I finally said, I got to decide. I got to pick something. And I chose the business that my father was in because I looked up to him and uh, uh, he had a sparkle in his eye was when it came to this industry. And that's how I got into it. I never worked in it. Uh, but if you were around our dinner table, you know, as a family growing up, that's all he ever talked about was what he did for a living. And uh, I think as I get older, you just realize how much your parents, whether they wanted to or not, had an impact on you. Correct. Correct. Now, did he explain like the business? Did he actually was he making it himself? Did he get other people to make it? Kind of get into that if you can. No, he he started out, he worked for a big liquor company called Jim Beam. And he started okay. out 45 years, he was 45 years in the business at that one company, which is crazy. Okay. Um, and that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, right. And he started out uh, in, in the advertising department and just worked his way up and became the head of the company. So wow. it wasn't a company he owned or we owned. It was a company he worked at. Um, and, uh, um, they, they were, he's taught, he taught me a ton and what he taught me is new brands are the lifebloods of, of not only our industry, of every industry, mm -hmm. uh, you need new brands, you need new themes, you need new ideas because that's what revitalizes any category you're in, whether it's in shoes or music or 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 in the liquor business um or clothing you just need new brands new excitement and and uh he taught me that talk about are you from new york or no originally chicago okay chicago so talk about living in chicago and, and a young brett barris you obviously were had a, a um, your father was very impressionable on you but talk about your dreams and aspirations growing up and kind of your journey into getting into the liquor business. I said, you said it wasn't until 30 where you realized you had to do something and you were going to break into the business your father was in. But talk about leading up to that 30 
What yeah, were you doing? How was your life up in there? I was, I had lots of ideas, just tons of ideas of business. I love business. I don't know what it was. Yeah. But uh, I, I, you know, I remember there was a girl in high school who invited me to her birthday party and I was so excited. Uh, she was very attractive, but I was more excited because I knew her father was just huge in real estate and he owned and he, and he, they took us to uh, the White Sox game. And I think he owned part of the White Sox and all I wanted to do, all my, all the friends who were invited were hanging out and in, in this, in, in the suites and playing games. And I just wanted to sit with him. I just want to sit and talk to him. And that's what I did. I just love business. Um, and, uh, uh, I started out in the banking business. I quit my job after the first year and I moved to Taiwan to study Chinese. Uh-huh. And then I ended up uh, living in Asia for five years, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. No idea why, still don't know why, I speak Chinese. Um, uh, <laughs> but I, I just was, you know, lost. And uh, my, my, as I said earlier, my biggest issue was I was always afraid to pick one thing I wanted to try to do because I was afraid it was the wrong idea and I would waste my time. I'd spend right. all this time doing something and it wasn't the right idea. Or I always, for some reason back then, I always felt, well, what happens if I stop coming up with ideas? Maybe I, you know, maybe it'll just stop. And what's happened is I pick something, I've focused at it and I never ran out of ideas. I still have them, but I, but I like doing what I'm doing. Right. Nice. Now, I know you, you talk about often Tom kind of having a chip on your shoulder because you said nobody really believed in you. I don't know if you were talking as much as the other brands you were maybe pitching to, but talk about that and take us back to your first, you know, liquor that you made and the pros and cons of that, if you can. Yeah, I think, you know, again, life is about learning, you know, and right. uh, I remember asking Tyrese this question, you know, if you could change anything, what what would you change? And he's the only person who basically said, fuck yeah, I'd change everything. I wish I could do it all over. You right. know? And in some ways he's right. Like, I wish I knew so much more. I wish, mm-hmm. you know, I, um, I wish I, I didn't do what I did for 10, 15 years was ask everybody what they think. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think of this idea? What do you think of that? And all you're doing is you're opening yourself up for failure because some, they're not going to like it. They're yes. not never going to like your idea. You know, I, I've had I've had more successful brands in the liquor space than anybody. Literally new brands from scratch to becoming big brands. And what they all have in common is no one believed in them. No <laughs> one in my industry believed. They said it would never work. You're picking the wrong categories. It's too expensive. Um, but but I, it took me a long time to realize I got to stop asking people what they think. And I just got to do my thing. And I got to, and more importantly, I can't rely on anyone. Don't rely on anyone because if you folk, if you're, if they come through, God bless, but if you're waiting, you're already lost. So I've made lots of mistakes, but everything I've learned from, and I continue to learn every day that, that that's how you get there. You make mistakes, you try things and, and you lean in on what works and what doesn't work, you move on. What was your first big break into the liquor business? We were like, "Oh shit, I can do this. This is it." Yeah, my, my, my it's it's straight. It's a it's a it's. I'm gonna answer it this way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they say like, uh, what what uh, when when as when it gets really dark is when it starts to get light or whatever the expression is. Um, I had investors. They wanted to wind up the company, and uh, uh, I remember calling my mother. Uh, who's my hero. She's my rock. She's my support. And that's what I tell everybody. You got to find one person in this world that's in your corner. I got, I got two people. I got uh, my mother and Rick Ross. Um, And I I remember telling her that they want to wind up the company. And, and I, I, and she says, Brad, I'll, I'll sell my rings for you, you know, and put more money in. And I said, no, I'll figure this out. But I remember telling her, I was standing on the corner of Broom and Canal Street, New York, outside my apartment. And I remember telling her, I love what I'm doing. And it's not about money. As long as I can live, just live. I'm happy. And to me, that was the break. To me, that's when I realized I got to slow it down. It's not about money. It's just about happiness. My success is based on just being in the moment. 
I needed that. I needed to go through that to get to where I am today. And I see, you know, I, I hear that in other people's stories too, but I think for me, it worked for me, you know, stop rushing, stop forcing it. I can't make it happen faster than it is. Just, just love what you do, appreciate the moment and eventually you'll get there. Right. Now, if you can talk about, you know, going into the, 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 sh the uh, champagne market, you know, competitors like uh, Moet, things like that, you putting your product Bel Air against that and smoking them. But, you know, just initially looking at that, like, you know, all right, we're going against this big company. What was your thinking going into that to compete with these bigger companies and smash them now? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, the key was, again, a mistake I made um, early mm -hmm. on where I, I, and I tell people this all the time, my, my mistake, when, when I figured it out, guys, was I'm, I tried to be like every, them and I'm not. And right. that's where my mistake always came in. So I can't be them. I can't compete with them. I can't invest the way they do. I can't market the way they do. I got to be me. I got to do what I feels right. And that's how I'm going to get there with all these brands. I'm not going to out market them. I'm not going to outspend them. I'm not going to out advertise them. I just got to do what feels right. And that's what's worked. Um, with Bel Air, and it's, it's a great example as a brand, everyone thought, you're nuts. How do you compete with Moet and Vouv, the Goliaths of the industry? You can't do it. And on top of that, I came out with Rosé first. I came out with the uh, the black bottle rosé. Yeah, you don't do that. You got to start with a brute. Everybody in Champagne, you start with the the brute bottle, which is the clear. It's the goldish liquid. Um, that's the eight hundred pound gorilla. But I didn't want to do that. The younger Brett would have done exactly that. But I said no. I want to make a name for myself in rosé first. I think that's its own category. I think it's its own thing. Men drink it. Women drink it. It's 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 global. And uh, I didn't listen. Um, the younger me would have listened to everybody. Okay, I should do brute. I should change the price point. I they told me, don't put it in a black bottle. You can't see the liquid. No, I got to trust my instincts. If anybody's going to fuck it up, it has to be me um, because I let other people screw it up for me by letting other, other people's decisions kind of rule what I do. So th that's what I've done on every brand is trust my instincts, trust my gut, trust my team. And let's lean into what we think feels right. Let's not pretend to be somebody else. Right. Now, if you can talk about, you know, because every time we see Rick Ross, we see that bottle next to him all over social media, everywhere. And we kind of everybody thinks he owns it. You know, now, now we know that you own it, but we thought that he owned it. But um, talk about meeting up with Rick Ross and his uh, influence on um, marketing the brand. And promoting it, the brand. Um, it well. I, I'm going to give a bunch of examples, whether it was Jay-Z or Lil Wayne or or, or uh, Khaled or uh, Wiz or right. uh, Steve Aoki, Nipsey, A Boogie, Post Malone, all these guys, what they all have in common is I didn't know them. I'm mm -hmm. not in the music business. I'm in the liquor business. And what they all have in common is they love the brands first. And that's what I tend, I wanted to lean into is if you're a fan of the brands and you love them and you want to work with me or do something or be part of this, that's where it starts. So this was me saying, again, this idea that, you know, if, if, if I love country music, I would have been leaning into that. Like that's my, that'd be my, my move, but I loved hip hop and I loved artists and when I saw somebody who's supporting me, I wanted to support him back. And Rick was a great example of that. He, he I had never met him. I never knew him. Um, he, he loved Bel Air. Uh, he made it a part of his life, his lifestyle. Uh, we, we were introduced by DJ Clue. Uh, we spent two years talking and then we started working together and we've been doing it for 13, 14 years now. And I consider him one of my closest friends. Um, that's how it works with me. I, I believe when I call orga you know, organic brand building, everything should happen naturally. If I'm, it's like, I can't force a relationship. I'm not going to run to the, the altar and get married with anybody I just met. And right. they shouldn't either. That's why my relationships work because I want to, I want them to last forever. They shouldn't end. That's not a good relationship. What was your first introduction to like, um, the artist in hip hop and how did that get introduced? Um, 
My my first big one, honestly, was uh, was uh, um, Jermaine Dupree. Okay. Okay. JD was. Uh, I love JD. He was he was ruling the world at the time. He had Mariah. He was running a label. He had the studio down in Atlanta. Um, and uh, it was Jermaine. Um, we were so close. He taught me a ton. Um, uh, but that was kind of the, the beginning stages of, of me leaning into the music space. Um, that was, yeah, that was probably the, the start. Uh, and back, you know, that, that was the beginning. That was the beginning for me. Why do you feel like hip hop? outside of any other genre of music has the influence on not only liquor, but pop culture, the way that it does in your opinion. Um, it's a great question. I think, I think it's, I think it's because it's, it's natural. It's, it's, it's a, it's, no one's forcing it on anybody. They're doing everything. Every move is based on love, love of something. You know, I, I jokingly say this, but in all seriousness, it's like I look at Rolex as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the sponsor, the average, the the spokesperson for Rolex is uh, the tennis player. Um, Not Andre Agassi. No, no, no. Uh, uh, Newer. Oh, no. What's his name? Uh, Jokic. No. Um, he got hurt. He's about to retire. You're talking not um 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 not Federer, Roger Federer. Yes, thank you. It's okay. Roger Federer. Okay. So I bet you Roger has one Roger, and I bet he was given it to him free by Rolex. Rick right. Ross has 50 Rolexes, bought them all, bought them all. He loves the brand. It's natural. It's it's an it, it's something that impacts him. You know, he loves Chevy cars. It impacts him. So I think this there's a raw you know, love of what you're into, what you're involved in, what speaks to you. And I think that's why, you know, it's, it, it, it people are leaning into things that, that if they enjoy it, they love it, they're going to live it. And I think that can have an, an amazing impact on culture, on style, on fashion, on, on everything. Personally, for me, the reason, if you ask me why me and hip hop, I just think, I think hip hop has a story to tell. I think every artist, it's a struggle to get to where they are. It's always an individual who, who does it. It's not a group. It's not a rock group and a band. There's a whole bunch of people. Um, and I love that side of it. I love the the up and coming side. I love that self-made side. Right. Now, is there a way to eat, to like measure like the effect that a Rick Ross and all these different you know rappers have on the brand? There's no way to really measure that really, is it? Cause not talk about that if you can. Yeah, it it's it's a good question. It's I think it's it's relevant to the time, right? And I think today is an example. You know, there's there's so many people in in every industry. There's so many people playing in celebrity brands, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's different today because social media. This is my opinion. Social media, Instagram, as an example, um, is amazing. It's an amazing tool, but it, what it's also done is made everybody famous. And if everybody's famous, no one's famous. So it's hard for brands to cut through. It's, you know, there are so many people in the music space that are in the liquor business. I bet you 99% of them, the brands don't work. So it's, it's, it's hard to cut through. And if it's not real, if it's not blood, sweat and tears involved in it, just like their own music, I think I think their fans see it. They see it. It's not something that they're really it's really part of them. Um, so it depends. It depends. How involved are you in the creation of the liquor from the the taste to the, the look to the style? How, how involved are you in those processes? Oh, 100 percent. Everything. So we have uh, um, it's a strange thing to say. We have no agencies. We don't use outside vendors and we don't get pitched brands or pitched, you know, labels and designs. It's all internal. It's to me, it's it's like art. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's 
it's you see you have an inspiration for a design for a bottle you have an inspiration for a logo you have an ins- it to me it's like music you know you have a beat you like you hold on to it you have a hook you like you hold on to it you have a story you tell you you hold on to it it's to me in 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 brand building it's the same thing and when it comes to the liquor itself there's a few of us who taste and this is trusting our instinct that what we think um if we like it we think 90% of the world's going to like it um and I'm I'm always shooting for something that, if you tasted bamboo as an example, our rum, it tastes better than any other rums. And I want to look people in the eye and tell them that because I truly believe that my whiskey, it tastes better than any other whiskey. It does. I can look you. I can tell you why. I can tell you the story behind the brand, and I believe it. And I will only ever launch brands. Um, if I have the greatest package in the world, but if I don't like the liquid, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. It needs, the taste is the most important. That's the end all. So we're a hundred percent involved in everything. How do you find that ideal taste? Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. It, um, it's, it's hard. Well, the, the way I do it is I drink the category. It's strange. I drink the category and start with. So in the whiskey category, I was drinking all sorts of whiskeys. Um, bourbons in Kentucky, Tennessee whiskeys, scotches, Japanese, Irish. And I found that there's a style I liked that really wasn't there in the product. And the style I wanted was what I call uh, bonfire, kind of like, like you're roasting marshmallows. And then there's something called peat, this peated style. And if I could get those two things in my whiskey, and not too much, not where it, it almost feels like you're having an old shoe, which I like, but I think 10% of consumers will like that. The 90% won't. Um, and I hit it. I nailed it. And I nailed it with the blend we created, with where we produce it in Scotland, the style. And I think it tastes better than any other whiskey in the world. And and it, it, in cocktails straight, that's how it starts. I drink and I uh, and there's a style I want. And how does that taste against the competitors I'm going after? Now, you, you're working on a new um, a new liquor. Um, how, how do you what's the process of bringing that to market? Do You do a commercial or is it something non-traditional or do you it, just put it on the shelf? Can you talk it, about that? It's a good question. So the way so when the brand is done and finished, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, there's a price point I want to hit. There's a package, a design, the name, the story, the liquid. It's all there. And then I have a philosophy. Sometimes not having a plan is a great plan. Yeah. And what that means is, and this is something I didn't do. Again, this is where I made mistakes. If you if you plan too hard, if you've got an idea, direction of where something should go, if you hold on, if you don't, if you hold on to it too long, you're going to be wrong for as long as you put that plan in place. Mm-hmm. So for me, what I do is I just let it go. I want to sell to everybody and anybody because I think my brands are cool and they're, they're premium and everyone's going to like them. I want to sell everywhere and then we'll see where, where it's working and lean into it, where it's not. So if I take my rum, Bamboo, which is, which is this brand, the, in in Canada, as an example, um, is my number one volume market in the world outside the U.S. Okay. No one from our company has ever been to Canada. Mm, wow. Never. Had I not released it there and, and let it go, I wouldn't have seen that. Mm. In, in the U.S., this brand is 95, Bel Air is 95% retail. We, we have a massive business at retail. In Korea, and we're number one in the category. In Korea, this brand, Bel Air, is the number one champagne in Korea. 95% of this is sold in on-premise bars, restaurants, nightclubs. Completely two different channels, but they both work. So to me, this is where I just, I let it go and lean in to see where it works because you can't overthink this stuff. To me, it's like, to give you an example in the music space, and I always ask this of artists, if you ask any artist, their number one commercial success, if they thought it was going to be successful, their answer is no. 
They didn't like it. They didn't think yeah. it would work. It wasn't a good song, but they put it out and look what happened. Yeah. And to me, that tells a story, which is you just kind of try a bunch of stuff. Yeah. You got to let it go and you're going to learn from it what works and what doesn't work. Are your parents still alive? And if they're not, unfortunately, did they were they able to see your success? Um, my mom is, uh, she's 93, she'll be 94 this year. She rollerblades every day. Wow. She's, she's got her, she wears a, a hat, a t-shirt, a sweatshirt of our brands every day. She's got her own business cards. She's, uh, fearless. She's relentless. She's, uh, my hero. She's my support. Um, my biggest fan. She's been there. She's my one person who's been there Day one, every time I cried and wanted to kill myself, she was there. Um, my father just, he was 91, just passed away uh, uh, a month or so ago. Um, and they, they, it, they, they, they've they seen it and they're super proud. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm very lucky. Yeah, to, to do it, like when you, because we... We found our success in this business when we were about in our 30s. And you hear the cliche is you got to get out of high school, get into college. And if you don't find it then and it's in your 30s or 40s, oh, shit. Like, yeah, but to find success and to be able to have your parents be able to sit there and grind with you through all them years and see the fails and see the ups and see the downs, but be able to see the pinnacle of your success. I think we all strive for that, man. I think we A hundred percent. And for me, it's, you know, and I'll hit my mom all the time. She was there. Like, it's neat to say that to somebody. You were there for me. You held me up. You supported. You saw, you know, she'd call back when I had Ace of Spades. I mean, I, I lost my house. I stopped paying. I stopped paying my mortgage so I could put more money back in the business. And I got my house foreclosed on. Wow. I stopped paying the IRS, the taxes, because it was my <laughs> way of putting more money in the business. And who knew? I didn't know that the IRS can find your bank account. And they oh, swept, yeah. <laughs> they swept it. You know, like she was there through all this. Um, right. She would call back in the Ace of Spades days. This was early. You know, she'd call. I give her a phone book full of of, of liquor stores uh, to call because she just wanted to help. So she'd call liquor yeah. stores and ask, do you have Ace of Spades? Just so they hear it. Just so they right. hear it. So there's nothing better you know, that's when, you know, I wouldn't change a thing where you get, to, as long as you remember those stories and you share them and you realize, you know, that, uh, and that's why I, I like sharing that side because I think people think, um, you know, same with you guys, you were probably, people probably look at you and say, you were always successful. You're not, there's a struggle there. And so I love the telling the struggle side because for me, it would it motivate the shit out of me, if the younger me. Yeah. Right. Now, if you can um go back to Ace of Spades, if you can, and just briefly touch on that, um, and then eventually selling that brand to you know Jay Z, if you can. Yeah, it, uh, amazing brand. Uh, right. My first big success. Uh, everyone said, "Don't do it. You're nuts. You're you're creating a not only a new champagne, but a new champagne that's priced higher than every other champagne out there, Dom Cristal and Krug, which yeah. is insane." You put it in this gold bottle where half the world hated it and half loved it. Um, you, we did a, if, if you're knowledgeable on champagne, we did something called a multi-vintage. So it's not a vintage. It's not a single year release, which in the champagne business is considered, you know, you, you can't do that at the premium level, which I think is ridiculous because to me, anybody can make a vintage. You just wait and, and put it in a bottle. The hard part is making a blend. That's the fun part. That's like, to me, it's like painting. If you have one color, you can't do much. If you have a multitude of colors, boy, you can create a, you know, okay. depth and, and, and length. Um, but I did it. I, uh, it was hugely successful. Um, people ask me, you know, why sell? Why'd you do it? And for me, it was, it's till today, still this day, it's the single hardest thing I've ever done. It's like selling a child. Um, but what it did was it gave me money that I never had before where I could do all these other ideas that I wanted to do. So I had bamboo sitting on the shelf. Um, it was sitting there for eight years, but I couldn't launch it because mm -hmm. I didn't have the money. I had these all, the, all these other brands and these other ideas. Um, so I look at it as it, it, it's like cutting off your arm and now I'm stronger. And that's what it's done. It's allowed me to do all these other things and, 
and and have security and be able to to grow the business and keep growing. Now, obviously, the person you sold it to, Jay-Z at the time, uh, the pinnacle that he's reached in success is far greater than any hip hop artist we've ever seen. And a lot of just one of the biggest success stories we've ever seen. How was it working with him at that time? And did you see that vision of him? OK, it is dude. He's something different. Did you see that at the time? Um. I'd love to say yes, but it's my attitude. Meaning, <laughs> meaning again, I go back to, I don't want to rely on anybody because yeah, yeah. I think that's where you make a mistake. Yeah. I have no clue. You know, I could name, you know, so many, you know, famous people who say they're going to do what they say they're going to do, but don't do it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So to me, it's, 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 uh, you, you know, I, I think it's a healthy way to look at the world where you just got to go do it. You have to go do it. And if anything else happens, fantastic, you know, and, but Jay's amazing. He's awesome. And the presence he had on the brand and what he did amazing. Um, but life is, there's no question. Life is timing, um, you know, and, and, uh, and luck and hard work and you mix all those together and you got something special. All right. Now you are you do you do any type of music or anything or uh me personally? Yeah. Um no well no but and now yes. Okay. So we're yeah. this is me where we're leaning into things that we like. So Okay. Um we we've been doing this for years where we like supporting artists. So we'll okay. we've got a video team. We'll shoot videos for people. We'll put artists together. We'll uh, uh, produce songs for people. We we don't want to own the artist. I want to get involved with the artist. I want to help the artist. And then we started moving our business into Africa. And we've got a tremendous business in Africa. And I'm a huge fan of Afrobeats, huge fans of I'm piano, I'm huge fans of music coming from there. And now we get to talk to all these artists. And now what we're doing is we're actually going to be producing our own album. And yeah. it's an Africa album that's going to have 10, 12, 14, 20 plus artists on it from uh, 12 different countries. Uh, nice. Ross is on every song. Um, okay. Some of the biggest names in Africa. And to me, I want to shine a light on Africa and try to get, let's just use simply American artists to do more in Africa. Because if they do that, everyone in Africa is going to love them for life. And they got to do more of that. Definitely. Brett Barris from the Hip Hop and Sense of Podcast. We definitely appreciate your wealth of knowledge and your story. Definitely appreciate your transparency because the struggle is definitely a story that needs to be told because without it, there is no success and people don't realize that. I wanted to ask you because you got a ton of liquor brands. You've talked about Bamboo a lot. You've talked about Bel Air. You've talked about your whiskey. What's your most prized possession? What's that one liquor that you said, man, I put my foot in this motherfucker and this is it right here? My favorite one. Ah, uh, it's the one that's not here. Mm. Okay. It's my, it's my, and I say this and I'm not kidding about it, but my, my first brand doesn't exist. Um, it's an amazing brand. It was an amazing brand. It didn't work, but it's because of that brand. And what I went through is why I'm successful today. It's mm -hmm. literally everything I spew from, you know, uh, that brand. I would, I wait for somebody else to help me make it happen. I, uh, I wouldn't make the decisions. I would let th think that everyone's smarter than me and therefore I should follow their lead. Um, I didn't trust my instincts. I stuck to the plan too long. Um, I tried to emulate everybody else and not be myself. So I, I look at it as that brand is, is in all my brands. Uh, it's part of everything I do. And I, Simply put, it, it I treat the brands like I have six kids in my family. I literally have six kids. I love them all. They're all great. Every day, one is a little bit more special for whatever reason. Um, I don't. I'm, I'll admit that one does something fantastic, and I love them a little more. And that's how I treat the brands. Where you know, today I'm drinking Bamboo Cream. It just it moves me. You know, tomorrow could be the Deacon, but it's that first brand that taught me everything that I'm most proud of. Awesome. 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 We definitely appreciate your time. Brett Barris on the hip hop and sense of podcast. Before we get out of here, let the people know where they can find you, 
any upcoming events or anything that you would like to share with the people. The floor is yours. We definitely appreciate your time. Absolutely. So you uh, find me uh, on Instagram, Brett Bearer, CEO, any of our brands, Official Bel Air, Original Bamboo, uh, Deacon Whiskey, uh, McQueen Violet Fog, Vion France are our brand handles. Um, uh, the newest brand is the Deacon uh, Whiskey is just amazing. So I highly recommend if you like our brands, you're going to love this one. Um, the big thing for me now is, and we touched on it is music. So I'm super excited about this album coming. I think it'll be the biggest thing in Africa. Um, nice. we got huge names on it. Uh, and we're always looking for more names and more producers to jump on board. We want to highlight everybody and, uh, that's it. And, and most importantly is, as you put it, Sam, the struggle. So, uh, learn, there is no such age as a wonderful thing because uh, you, you, as long as you're learning, you're going to get better at everything. Appreciate, appreciate you. you. Yes, Brett Barris on the Hip Hop Essential Podcast. Appreciate the time and sharing your wisdom once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yes, Thanks sir. for having me on. Kill it. All right. Much appreciate more it. Will do. All right.